It's very important for, in particular, those who live in the West, for the Western left to realize that the biggest obstacle to renewing socialism in some of these societies is exactly that traumatic legacy of state socialism. And we need to ask ourselves what was missing in these societies. Where uh, exactly, I think, the moral question was the one that was marginalized the concern for what we might call first generation liberal freedom, so freedom of thought, freedom of association, freedom of speech, was in part the first victim of exactly this project that had this kind of historical determinism embedded in it. And so we really need to think of the socialist tradition as a real radicalization of the liberal tradition, but not as a supplantation. So as an effort to think about, okay, how can we radicalize that in terms of thinking about it more consistently and across the world with a more uh, universal scope? Well, guys, hello and welcome to this week's episode of the Dissense Podcast. On the program this week, Lea Ippi. Lea Ippi is a philosopher and political theorist from the London School of Economics. And right now, Lea is holding the Benjamin Chair at the Center of Social Critique in Berlin. And she's holding a few lectures on the topic of socialism in the 21st century, how it can be renewed in our times. Yeah, and I'm super stoked to have her here to talk about the topic of her lectures, What is Moral Socialism? Lea, thank you for joining me. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah, the pleasure is all mine. Um, Leah, let's talk moral socialism. Um, as I understood it, your project is kind of twofold. First, it's a radical critique of capitalism um, and showing why socialism is still relevant for us today um, as a tool to advance freedom. But also it's a radical critique of dogmatic orthodox Marxism and orthodox socialism. And yeah. um, they are the past forms of authoritarian socialism. So it kind of shows how we have to reinvent socialism uh, for the 21st century. So for starters, Leah, explain a bit what's the purpose of your project and uh, what do you mean by moral socialism? Hmm. The effort behind my project on moral socialism is to construct a critique of capitalism at a time in which I think politically we need exactly that sort of critical engagement with the societies in which we live on the one hand, but on the other also to recover a tradition of socialist thinking that is distinguished from the kind of appropriations of socialism that we have seen in the past century. And so I use the term moral socialism to distinguish it from the kind of immoral socialism that characterized the experiences of a socialist state in the 20th century, all of which have ended up in the tragedies that we are familiar with. And what I try to do is with this term to signal both the need for an alternative to capitalism, but also an alternative that tries to learn from these failures of state socialism in the 20th century. And uh, it's called moral socialism because it starts with a moral critique of capitalism that recovers a tradition in the history of political thought that goes back to the German Enlightenment, in particular the thought of the philosopher Immanuel Kant, And with the recovery of that critical potential in the Enlightenment, then traces a critique of capitalism that I still think is relevant for contemporary societies. Mm. Yeah, it's quite interesting also philosophically, uh, because in your idea of moral socialism, you not only turn to Kant, uh, but also to Marx, um, two thinkers that are, I think, often seen as incompatible. Kant associated uh, mostly with idealism, individualism and liberalism and Marx with materialism, collective struggle and socialism. So I'm really, really interested how you marry the two liberalism and socialism. And you can give us a glimpse into your lectures uh, later into that podcast. But yeah. before we dive deeper into your form of Kantian Marxism or your idea of moral socialism, I want to hear a bit about um, what motivated you personally to defend socialism as a project of freedom Because this might seem counterintuitive when one looks at your biography and you write about your um, yeah, childhood in your book Free. And there one can learn that you grew up in Albania, mm. which was kind of the last Stalinist state in uh, Europe before the fall of socialism in 1990. Um, and then it became like a liberal capitalist state. Um, so you experience firsthand kind of how unfree or in your language, immoral socialism in the past has been 
So I wondered, Leah, how your personal experience of living in an unfree society, but also experiencing the transition to capitalism, how all of that informed your conception of freedom and your idea of reimagining socialism? Yeah, so I grew up in these societies. Uh, I spent my childhood in Albania under state socialism and my teenage years and then adulthood in uh, capitalism. And to some extent, the book Free is an effort to think about what freedom means both as an ideal and as an ideology, starting with the real world historical appropriation of this concept of freedom and the way in which then it's being packaged in different societies that serve different uh, social purposes, but uh, with an element of, as I say, appropriation that distorts the philosophical understanding of freedom, the way I refer to the concept and the way I understand it. It was also uh, a part of my philosophical convictions has always been that at the level of philosophical theory, although liberalism, liberal capitalism and socialism are often presented as very, very different theories and very different ways of understanding society. And liberal theory is often thought to be about freedom and socialism about equality. I think there is something common to both of these traditions in the effort to think about freedom and to articulate what freedom means in society. And where I actually theoretically always engaged with the socialist tradition as a tradition that tried to radicalize liberal idea of freedom and to point out the gaps and the contradictions and the remainders in that idea of freedom. Mm. So the lived experience was that of being under state socialism where uh, unfreedom took a very vertical form of oppression where you had the state and you had the party and th then you had a kind of authoritarian system that exercised its power on the individuals through these state institutions. And on the other hand, that uh, vertical authority was replaced by a different uh, type of power exercise that was more horizontal and more dispersed and where oppression came from the kind of anonymous market structures that capitalist societies embody and that came to Albania in some way after this um, transition from state socialism. And where, again, you ask the question, well, what does it mean to live in a free society? given all the trauma of that transition and given the social and political cost of all the free market neoliberal reforms that came to post-communist societies after that transition. And so the rethinking of socialism comes from, on the one hand, the importance of reappropriating this socialist tradition that is concerned with the same idea of freedom as in the liberal tradition, and on the other hand, the effort to learn from these failed experiences of social, state socialism and to ensure that we have learned something from this engagement. Mm. Yeah, when it comes to the advancing of liberal socialism, I learned that in the 20th century, uh, there was this school of Kantian Marxism associated with social democracy also. Mm. So maybe you can talk about this tradition, which you rely on, because Kant today, I think, is used explicitly or implicitly, at least, um, yeah, almost always to defend capitalism and the liberal state. And when it comes to the critique of capitalism, then it seems to me Kantianism is associated more with the mitigation of capitalist exploitation uh, and alienation and not the overcoming of capitalism, actually. Um, so it's more of a social democratic reformist tradition um, than of a kind of revolutionary politics. So why do you think there is a radical emancipatory potential in Kant? Yeah, this uh, critique of uh, capitalism on Kantian grounds has actually some historical predecessors. And it's interesting that these historical predecessors were squeezed out by the conflicts of the 20th century. There were some efforts to think about the radical emancipatory potential within Kantian theory in the, uh, in, in the cross between sort of the, uh, the beginnings of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, with the neo-Kantian schools that emerged both in Germany and then later a little bit later in Austria, and where uh, there was, for example, this important neo-Kantian philosopher called Hermann Cohen, who said that uh, Immanuel Kant was the real founder of German socialism. And what he meant by that was that in the recovery of the Kantian moral philosophy, which is grounded on this notion of uh, moral morality based on the categorical imperative, which is in turn based on the effort to universalize and to think of human beings not just as a means, but also as ends in themselves, uh, 
these German Kantians of the 20th century, the beginnings of the 20th century, said that this Kantian principle of never treating someone as a means only, but always also as an end, was something that was violated in capitalist structures, which commodified people and tended to actually think of human relations as relations that were purely instrumental in the pursuit of capitalist profit. Mm. In Austrian corners, there were also uh, several important contributions from these Austro-Marxists that I referred to in tracing the lineage of this critique of capitalism with Kantian foundations. So people like Otto Bauer, Max Adler, uh, Karl Renner, all of which were central figures in the uh, founding of Austrian social democracy and German social democracy, which had a radical critique of capitalist societies, but also was somewhat different from the other orthodox Marxist currents, which were reliant purely on historical materialism. So in a way, it's true that Kant has recently been appropriated by uh, more liberal readings, sometimes even authoritarian readings appropriate him. But there is also a, a lot of potential in Kantian theory for a reinterpretation of uh, Kant's practical reason and for a political application of that moral theory, which is in a way what the project tries to do by recovering elements from these other forgotten traditions, which were not so much forgotten as themselves a result of this intellectual violence of the 20th century, which ended up squeezing out all the alternatives to either liberalism or historical materialism, the two kind of dogmatic orthodoxies of the time. Uh, could you talk a bit more about that intellectual marginalization that you just mentioned? Uh, I mean, this tradition of left Kantianism or Kantian Marxism, as I understood it, it was uh, associated with uh, social democracy in the 20th century mm. and engaged in these times in yeah, fierce intellectual battles. So um, on the one hand, um, it maybe got marginalized by dogmatic Marxism and within social democracy by reformist positions, I guess. So maybe, Leah, tell us a bit more about how this school of Kantian Marxism got marginalized. Well, I mean, it was the, the what was interesting about this effort was that in some ways it was connected to the uh, social democratic effort. So one of the most prominent neo-Kantians who were also a Marxist was Eduard Bernstein, who was the founding father of German social democracy. And in part, this critique of Kantian Marxism ended up a victim of the then revolutionary socialist critique of German social democracy, even though not all the social democrats that appropriated this critique were actually uh, reformists. They thought about still the importance of overcoming capitalism, and they thought of the Kantian theory as a tool through which they could construct these critiques of capitalist society that showed why capitalists economic, moral, political, social relations are deeply flawed because they tend to reproduce certain pathologies that undermine the realization of the moral potential. Mm -hmm. So all of these theorists, they had differences between them. Some, like the Austro-Marxists, were closer to historical materialism in that uh, someone like Otto Bauer, for example, said, well, it's not that the Kantian theory can do all the work of criticizing capitalism. It gives you the moral foundation, but then you need the uh, empirical analysis of society that comes from Marxist tradition to explain what exactly are the contradictions of capitalist society. Uh, why is it that it's a society of class conflict? Why is it the centrality of the workers? And why is the working class the kind of universal class that Marx thought would advance human emancipation? But they attempted to, as I say, combine elements from the Marxist uh, analysis, empirical analysis of society with elements from the Kantian uh, theory and the Kantian tradition, and in particular, moral normativity. And there were some differences between them. As I say, the German uh, Kantians were more moderate and perhaps a little bit more reformist. The Austrian ones were uh, going in a different direction. But what was crucial and common to all of them was this idea that morality is universal and freedom is to some extent what we see through moral agency and that capitalist structures prevent us from reaching this degree of emancipation and of human uh, moral potential. Hmm. And looking at the left today, Leah, uh, what kind of limitations do you see regarding uh, its critique of capitalism? Or framed differently, um, why should lefties uh, read a bit more Kant besides Marx? Um, yeah, for the purpose of this podcast here, we're going to ignore the question whether one can reconstruct a radical democratic socialism without Kant, mm. because there's certainly on the left also a kind of anarcho-communist tradition um, that got marginalized as well. And that, um, yeah, is philosophically 
but also politically a tool um, to advance a more libertarian socialism. But yeah, many of our listeners are engaged in left-wing politics today, uh, working on issues like climate justice or global justice, for instance. Um, so why do you think um, they should read a bit more Kant besides Marx or frame differently what is lacking? What are the limitations of some critiques of capitalism and revolutionary politics that you see today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, as I say, it's, there are two limitations. The first one is in reckoning with the problematic history of socialism, where I don't think there can be any effort to renew socialist thinking that doesn't go through a serious critical engagement with the legacy of socialism on state socialist, uh, former communist societies and former state socialist experiences, in part because I think Uh, it's very important for, in particular, those who live in the West, for the Western left to realize that the biggest obstacle to renewing socialism in some of these societies is exactly that traumatic legacy of state socialism. And that limitation needs to be recognized. And we need to ask ourselves what was missing in these societies, where uh, exactly I think the moral question was the one that was marginalized in part because these societies were societies that developed a kind of Marxist project that somehow didn't pose the moral question because it assumed that it's part of the historical process to somehow settle the conflicts and uh, where the concern for what we might call first generation liberal freedom, so freedom of thought, freedom of association, freedom of speech, was in part the first victim of exactly this project that had this kind of historical determinism embedded in it. And so It seems to me that to, to begin to recover the meaning of socialism in societies that were former communist societies, we really need to engage with the uh, failures of state socialism in terms of concern for uh, these first generation liberal freedoms. And so in a way to think of the socialist tradition as a real radicalization of the liberal tradition, but not as a supplantation. So as an effort to retain what is productive about these societies, including this conception of freedom of thought and freedom of speech and freedom of association that I've been talking about. And then to think about, okay, how can we radicalize that in terms of thinking about it more consistently and across the world with a more uh, universal scope? So this takes me to the second aspect, which I think is really important, which is that the left right now is very fragmented. And it's a left that, as you mentioned, is engaged in environmental questions. There is a part of it that is engaged in post-colonial questions. There is a part of it that is engaged in the kind of critique of traditional forms of the left. But it seems to me that there is very little that um, enables us to bring together all these different types of critique, in part because of a hostility towards the notion of universal morality, and in part because this now, this conception of universalism, which was the result of the Enlightenment, is often marginalized because of a post-colonial critique of the Enlightenment that says, well, the Enlightenment is responsible for these historical experiences of oppression and exploitation of other parts of the world. Where it seems to me that in throwing out, uh, we we're kind of throwing out the baby with the bathwater because it seems to me that it's really important to retain the critical element of the Enlightenment and this idea that there is a universal human capacity for critique that can be mobilized against all authoritarian structures, against ideology, against manipulation, against false consciousness. And that is really important to recover, to bring together all these different struggles for the left in the absence of a thought that is capable of placing all these different elements of the critique in one ground. And it seems to me that we need to first uh, go back to rethinking, okay, what is the foundation of the socialist critique of society? And to return to this notion of radicalizing critiques of freedom and to confer it the kind of universalism that has been deprived of. And then think about, okay, what are the social movements, the political parties, the types of political mobilization, the types of agency that we need to be able to then turn this moral project into a political project that can inspire future generations and can inspire citizens. Mm. Yeah, let's pick up on that question later. What kind of agents today can turn this moral project of socialism into a reality, actually? But I want to quickly follow up on the notion of universality, because um, that also seems to be something that stands in the way of the 
left becoming a dominant player again. I totally subscribe to the efforts that we have to think universally, but at the same time, we have to recognize that universalism in the past and also today has been used and is used to, to actually oppress people. Um, so when we look at the colonial or neocolonial structures, for instance. Mm. So this question of universality um, seems quite central also when we look globally at a divided left um, so is it possible in your eyes to rescue universalism and the enlightenment um, from the failures of the past and the failures of today? I think the uh, the way to answer that challenge is like thinking about the internal pluralism and diversity within the enlightenment and how we have lost the nuance in reflecting on the enlightenment where, uh, yes, the enlightenment was appropriated and uh, distorted, I would say, manipulated by political elites who in pursuit of capitalist projects engaged with colonial expansion, with exploitation of other parts of the world, were then also helped by certain elements of a narrative, of civilizational narrative that people tend to associate with the uh, Enlightenment defense of the superiority of certain forms of life. But there were also, as part of that process, many uh, movements, marginalized groups, uh, slaves that revolted that appealed to exactly the principles of the Enlightenment to resist the capture by capitalist societies and to resist imperialism. And so it seems to me that uh, the problem there is really more capitalism than it's the Enlightenment. In some ways, I would say the problem is not that we have had the Enlightenment. The problem is that we've never had the full Enlightenment, that we've not had enough Enlightenment to be able to see how this critique of society, that this tradition, philosophical tradition of the Enlightenment, enabled at the level of thought, never really took off and never became part of uh, political traditions or where it was part of those political traditions is now being marginalized. It's, I mean, I teach at the LSE uh, a lot of black Marxist thought and a, a number of Mar black Marxist authors look up to the Enlightenment as a tool through which black people can then rebel certain against certain colonial and imperial and racist practices that were entrenched by uh, capitalist elites. So, as I say, there is uh, there is two ways of looking at the question. One is to say, well, the Enlightenment is responsible for these practices. The other one is to say there is a lot of internal diversity and we have to understand what the core claim of the Enlightenment is, which is this, as I see it, idea of critical uh, universalism and reason that underpins then also the struggles to overcome structures of authority that may come in the form of imperial and colonial uh, projects of conquest. Mm. I think one of the crucial elements of Kant's thinking and it's of its relevance for the contemporary world is that Kant is uh, someone who places the category of cosmopolitanism at the center of his thought. And so what we need to recover is, again, our ability to think about politics in a way that makes the world the unit of concern and where the struggles aren't just limited to how do we think about politics in this country or in that country, because again, that fragments the left and I think doesn't prevent it from coming up with a political project that can actually be coordinated transnationally. And I think a critique of capitalism that is not transnational can never be uh, an effective critique of capitalism because capitalism is a transnational phenomenon. It's a set of institutions and it's a set of social relations and it's a set of economic practices that are not restricted to one particular country. So if we confine the critiques of capitalism to the critiques of capitalism in one country, then it's going to be really difficult to think about how to go beyond capitalism. We need to recover this way of thinking about the world as the, uh, the unit of concern. Now, that doesn't mean that the types of politics and the types of struggle aren't um, adapted to each particular context and that there isn't a political specificity. But it's really important, I think, to have a universal critique that then becomes applied through the contextual uh, analysis and through the contextual engagement of different social and political movements. And again, I think the left has kind of lost its capacity to think about agency in a way that is effective and able to navigate the struggles of the contemporary world. So it's a left that in some ways uh, rallies against certain uh, general questions, such as the concern for the environment, but then is unable to think about what do we need to do to go beyond the nation state when we think about solutions and when we think about coordination. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to turn now to your argument for moral socialism. Um, this is, of course, way too much to cover in our small episode here. But maybe you can give our listeners kind of a glimpse into your lectures and into your line of argument. 
Um, as I understood it, you kind of develop your case for moral socialism in three main themes, um, which are also covered then in three lectures. Uh, the first is the 19th um, of June. Mm. Um, and all of them kind of link back to a central question for Kant, which is, what is a human being? Mm. And you then kind of advance this question in three lectures. Um, the first one is, what can I know? Um, which is about a definition of the Enlightenment and what is reason. And um, the second one is about political implications. One can derive from Kant's idea of freedom. What should I do? Um, and then the third one is uh, what may I hope? Um, it's about the importance of a progressive understanding of history and having an enlightened idea of progress. Mm. Um, so again, of course, it's way too much to cover in uh, one episode and I encourage everybody to go to your lectures if they can. Um, but yeah, could you give us at least a, a rough sketch of your line of argument about moral socialism? Also addressing the interesting question, for me at least, how to marry Kantian ethics, um, how to use them as a starting point, but how to then advance them with a Marxian critique and radicalization. Yeah, so I think the, this question of what is the human being is the question that uh, uh, that Kant articulates and that he also breaks down and it's inspired by his efforts to think about, okay, there are the three questions. First, what can I know? Uh, the second, what should I do? And the third, what may I hope? Each lecture follows each of these questions in trying to reflect on how the Marxist project is, again, a kind of radicalization and an answer that builds on elements of the German idealist tradition and of the German Enlightenment that are already there and takes them in a direction, in a more specific direction of a critique of society. Mm -hmm. So the first question, which is, what can I know, is in many ways the question of the method. And it starts with the discovery for Kant of critical thinking. And this idea that in a world where we can't trust religion, we can't trust authority, in a world of uh, where we kind of observe injustices of various kinds that surround us and types of unfreedom, there's only one thing that is uh, there and that enables us to start questioning these institutions and these authorities to which we are subordinated, which is reason. And reason is, for Kant, is the foundation in a way of social critique, And reason is always embattled between these two poles, dogmatism on the one hand and skepticism on the other. And Kant says, well, we need to, in recovering critical thinking, we need to be alert about both of these dangers. And again, this resonates with me in terms of rethinking the experiences of state socialism, because these were very dogmatic socialist societies where somehow what they were doing, the question of the rightness of this project and the question of how that project interfered on the agents and on the individuals was constantly marginalized because it ended up favoring the collective and dogmatizing what the collective was. So dogmatism is uh, one of the critical poles of discussion for Kant. And the second one is uh, once we engage in a struggle against dogmatism, where do we, what do we rely on? And again, Kant says, well, reason is somehow generating of its own capacities and it's both the source of all errors but also it's the source of all certainty. And in some ways, we need to be able to be radical in our critique of society, but without losing hope in the human and this capacity for reason that the human always has. And it seems to me that this fundamental critique, which was also at the heart of the Kantian definition of the Enlightenment as the emergence from human beings' own immaturity, is exactly that which Marx then radicalizes with his critique of capitalism, where the project of intellectual emancipation turns into a project of social emancipation that is nurtured by a kind of critique of capitalism of the sort that Marx articulates in part as a result of his engagement with Hegel and with Hegel's philosophy of right, but in part also with social movements around the same time. So the first question is really on these concerns around method and critique and enlightenment and the critical meaning of the enlightenment and the importance of thinking universally about questions of social emancipation. Mm -hmm. The second one is about the problem of action. And so Kant says, well, the, the crucial question of action, of moral action is what ought I to do? And in that lecture, I try to, on the one hand, think about these foundations of practical reason in Kant. So this, you know, what does it mean to think morally? What does morality require? And then what is it about capitalism that makes it very difficult to uh, somehow realize human beings' moral potential? 
And that's by going into a critique of capitalism that is inspired again by the socialist tradition, but also by those authors who even before Marxism were beginning to see the pathologies of these proto-capitalist or emerging capitalist societies. And to say that many of these pathologies that were, that these authors identified are in some ways still the pathologies of capitalist societies that we experience today, where there is a, a kind of moral psychology that goes alongside this pursuit of profit. There is a way of thinking about the economy and the market, and there is a way of thinking about politics, all of which produce contradictions of their own, all of which make it very difficult to realize freedom, moral freedom understood in these Kantian terms. And then the lecture goes on to explore the question of alienation understood in these categories uh, that follow Kant's moral philosophy by thinking about the divorce between the image of what the moral agent ought to be and then the empirical manifestation of that agent in capitalist societies where there are obstacles to realizing this notion of moral social relations that Kant was um, aspiring to and that I think also informs a lot of the Marxist critique of society. Mm. And then finally, the third question is about uh, the question of what may I hope, which is in many ways both the, the problem of politics. So how do we think about politics in a way that can kind of give us perspective from which we can make sense of political action in a way that is coordinated and continues and that channels these moral efforts to overcome capitalism and to produce a, a better post-capitalist society. And uh, there I try and think about the overlaps in Kant's analysis of history and Marx's analysis of history, in particular with an attempt to recover Again, this question that is constantly marginalized as a result of the reassessment of the Enlightenment, which is a question of what is progress and how do we think about historical and political progress in a way that can address some of the post-colonial and post-modern challenges and recovers a conception of progress that incorporates some of these experiences of criticism of the Enlightenment, but again, doesn't completely give up on the category of uh, political progress, which I think is really important to motivate action of a certain kind. Yeah, super interesting. Um, by the way, I encourage everyone who's listening and who's able to see your lectures in Berlin um, to go there in person. And uh, probably, or hopefully, I think um, there's going to be a recording that we can watch on YouTube after your lectures. And um, one thing you didn't mention, Leia, is um, the climate crisis. And I wonder how you think about the ecological crisis and the case for moral socialism. Mm. Specifically, I think about the problem of capitalist expansion or capitalist growth as the root cause for climate disaster and its unjust consequences. So I wonder how would you integrate the ecological critique of capitalism and uh, limiting capitalist freedom to produce and consume? How would you integrate that in your line of argument, which also includes the problem that any socialism has to deal with scarcity um, and has to be an ecological socialism, I guess. Yeah, and I think this is where uh, a lot of critics often think that this is where, you, know, in some ways, you might see the limitations of the Kant project and, on, and indeed of the Enlightenment project, with, which is in many ways a humanist project. And so he centered on the human. And so often the critics will say, well, what does this project, what does this recovery of this new Enlightenment or new humanism, what does it have to tell us about nature? And I think that's where uh, we risk uh, a kind of false dualism in thinking about the nature and the human, because it seems to me that the kind of nature that we are thinking about now and the kinds of concerns that we have with nature, with sustainability, with the pr pr protection of nature are uh, concerns that come from a certain worry about the uh, ability for future generations to have a world that they can inhabit. So once you think about the human as not just the individuals that live here and now, But again, going back to this Enlightenment tradition as the human species, the human species isn't limited to whoever lived in the past and lives in the present, but it also is thinking about the conditions of possibility of reproduction of the species and the conditions of possibility of future moral agency. And so in that sense, the question of the environment is the question of a human-centered perspective in its engagement with nature, where uh, it's not that you think, well, you, we, we can do whatever we want with nature because we're humans. It's a, a, a sort of dialectical approach to our uh, way of thinking about uh, politics for the future that can guarantee future generations the same capacities to uh, have a sustainable life. And so in that sense, it's, it's ecological and it's concerned about the environment and it's sensitive to the conditions of uh, reproduction of our species as conditions of reproduction of our moral agency. Hmm. 
Yeah, and one could also argue it's not only a moral necessity with regards to future generations to go beyond capitalism, but also because of people suffering under climate disaster right now. Yeah. But this idea of moral socialism, uh, Leia, of a cosmopolitan, free and egalitarian society, which is, by the way, I guess, not so far off from visions of an anarchist uh, world commune. Um, of course, this idea is quite nice, but I wonder what's your idea of change, actually, because seeing how capitalism is turning more and more authoritarian, And we're seeing as well new forms of fascism on the rise. So the idea of like this moral socialism seems so, so far off. Mm. So what path to transformation do you see, Leah? Or what kind of struggles or agents are needed to bring about this vision of a new socialism? Mm. Yeah, so this is something that I uh, I discussed a little bit in my first book, actually, which was called Global Justice and Avant-Garde Political Agency, where I had the same concern with uh, developing a sort of radical egalitarian project, which is in some ways what uh, socialists understood on this, uh, this kind of humanist perspective also tries to do. And where I thought about the role that particular movements within the state can play in transforming state structures and in uh, somehow reorienting the state towards a socialist project and towards a cosmopolitan socialist project. So where it's not just about the development of one particular state, but developing uh, forms of coordination between political actors in different states that can transnationalize struggle. It seems to me that one of the, one of the greatest challenges, but that's also in some ways a consequence of us having lost our ability to think about working classes, for example, as universal, as opposed to just the workers of this or that country. And one of the reasons for why, for example, migration discourse is so divisive and so damaging for the left is that it's one of these areas where the right has managed to establish its hegemony in trying to make cultural lines driving conflict and to think about social conflict and political conflict as a conflict that is driven by differences in ethnicity, differences in claims of people who have different cultures, and where what is needed is a way to think about these types of social conflict as driven by the contradictions of capitalism rather than by cultural clashes, for example. And here, I don't think any single intellectual or any single theory will have the answer because it's actually a contextual answer. But what one can say in very general lines is that we need to recover the agents that have been captured by capitalist uh, structures in being able to push back against capitalism. And we need to recover both the discourse of the possibility of overcoming capitalism and the possibility of having something like a socialist society, but also the the traditional sites of political engagement. So it seems to me that we have lost, for example, the political party as we traditionally knew it that could fight for an alternative, whereby now political parties have all been captured by these uh, capitalist forces and have all turned into cartel parties that depend on funding, depend on uh, ex external donors, are themselves complicit with the kind of neoliberal power structures that make it very difficult for them to emancipate themselves. And so I think we need to go back to all these traditional democratic sites, the party, the social movement, and think about what is the distinctive contribution that each of them can make in advancing an alternative and what are the most effective types of struggle without being hostage to a way of thinking about parties, for example, which is now the party is just a mechanism for winning elections and for scoring points in the next election. So we need to recover, I think, the uh, somehow the, the way of thinking about political parties, to just take one example, as a site also of ideological struggle and to re-moralize the discussion around what is a party, what is it there for, who does it represent, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Hmm. But then I wonder again, what makes you hopeful or what sustains your hopes for such a future? Because as I already mentioned, the circumstances are quite dire, climate collapse, uh, the rise of fascism, the marginalization of left-wing politics that we see. So I myself and probably many of our listeners struggle with uh, feelings of frustration and desperation, I guess. So mm. what can give us hope in these times kind of links back to your ideas of hope and historical progress. So this last question, just for an outlook, what would you say to our listeners? How can we think about hope? Well, how can we think about hope to make sense of struggling and failing most of the time? Yeah, so I think uh, there are different ways of thinking about hope. So one of them is to have hope is to have a development in the world that 
tells us it will be okay, or there are things already happening out there that support our way of thinking. And I think that's a kind of wrong way of thinking about hope. It's almost like the hope of religious people who need to have some external reassurance or some external guarantee that things are okay. And it's a kind of hope that actually undermines and paralyzes political action, because in some ways, the crucial element of hope is that it needs to be self-sustained by a practical political attitude. So nothing needs to go well in the world for us to have hope, because in part, hope is manifested through the constant struggle and through the constant engagement with the world. And so the hope, the hope this is hope seen from this kind of Kantian practical perspective, which is hope is a kind of moral duty. You have insofar as we act in the world, insofar as we think about what's wrong with society, insofar as we advance these critiques of society and act compatibly with them and try to do what we can each in our different social roles, we are already hopeful. And uh, and so hope is a kind of, re- it's, it's, a, it's an instance that generates itself and doesn't need to rely on, an ex- on anything else. So the question, I think is it's a wrong way of asking the question to say, well, what gives us hope in the world? Because nothing needs to give us hope in the world. And in some ways, the worse it is, the more resolve we have to try and change the way things are. And what is needed is just the, uh, the understanding and the criticism that can then empower us to want to have political change. But uh, as I say, this is a kind of political hope that is very, very different from the type of hope that, as I say, religious uh, outlook might have. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for your work. I can't wait to actually see the book publication coming out of this project. And uh, yeah, thank you as well for coming onto my show. Thank you. Thank you. Ja, Leute, das war's auch schon wieder. Das war der Dissens-Podcast für diese Woche. Ich hoffe mal, es hat euch gefallen. Ähm, wenn ihr euch für Lea Ippi oder ihre Benjamin Lectures interessiert, dann schaut doch mal in die Show Notes. Da habe ich alle wissenswerten Infos verlinkt. Ich werde das dann, wenn es eine Aufzeichnung gibt von den Benjamin Lectures, auch noch um diesen Link ergänzen. Dann könnt ihr euch Lea Ippis Argument für einen moralischen Sozialismus dann auch noch mal in Gänze anschauen. Ja, und bitte vergesst nicht, diesen Podcast hier, den Dissens-Podcast, den kann ich nur machen, dank meiner Fördermitglieder. Wenn du noch nicht dabei bist und du es dir leisten kannst, dann schließ doch jetzt eine Fördermitgliedschaft ab. Das geht schon ab 3 Euro im Monat und du tust damit nicht nur etwas Gutes und sorgst dafür, dass ich unabhängig, kostenlos und werbefrei für alle da draußen senden kann. Nein, es winken auch Goodies und du hast jede Woche die Chance auf einen coolen Verlosungsgewinn. Dieses Mal gibt's von Lea Ippi das Buch frei zu gewinnen. Alle Infos dazu, wie du bei Dissens mitmachen kannst, gibt es natürlich in den Shownotes und auf dissenspodcast.de. So, das war's dann auch von mir für diese Woche. Bleibt nur noch zu sagen, danke euch fürs Zuhören und bis zum nächsten Mal. Musik